With the new year just around the corner, I thought we'd have a look back at the Millennium Bug, more specifically in regards to radio. The Millennium Bug led many to predict a meltdown of critical infrastructure when the calendar year changed from 1999 to 2000. In short, the bug related to potential computer errors in the formatting and storage of calendar data for dates in and after the year 2000. Many programs displayed four-digit years as two digits, for example 1998 as 98 and 1999 as 99, therefore making the year 2000 indistinguishable from 1900. The inability of computer systems to distinguish dates correctly had the potential to bring down worldwide infrastructures reliant on them. There was genuine fear-mongering that led to people expecting planes to fall out of the sky. The potential damage was predicted to be $400 to $600 billion, and the whole thing caused quite the concern, especially when it was hyped up by the tabloid media, leading people to stock up on food, water, and weapons for a computer-induced apocalypse. Contrary to published expectations, few major issues occurred in 2000. Supporters of the Y2K remediation effort argued that this was primarily due to the preemptive action of many computer programmers and information technology experts. A millennium bug catastrophe would have manifested itself first in telecommunications, power, transport and media. Millennium bug doom mongers were continually warning that national communications could break down. I don't think the outlook of radio stations was quite so bleak, as they asked people to tune in for the latest Millennium Bug news and information. The major concern was with the emergency services. It wasn't so much a concern that the bug would affect radio systems themselves, but rather the power systems used to keep them on the air. The Lancashire Force for One took delivery of 17 generators to power their communications equipment if anything were to happen. They were set up at remote radio sites and at the Force's police stations. Some forces had Millennium Policing Project teams. These teams conducted thorough inspections and tests to all of their systems, including their radio infrastructure, to ensure the Millennium passed without a glitch. One leaked report revealed that eight police and fire areas failed to take adequate precautions against the bug and had little chance of stopping a serious breakdown. Radio communication systems were at the biggest risk, along with CCTV control rooms, the central police database, surveillance equipment and helicopters. Local councils and emergency planning departments were also concerned about the possible effects of the Millennium Bug on their radio systems. Raynet, a long-established amateur radio network whose members would provide emergency voice communications, were contacted by some local councils for support. Five Council, for one, outlined their contingency plans that were being put into place to cope with the difficulties which might arise with the onset of the new century. The fruits of their labour were presented in June 1999. Emergency services from the police to the council already had a sophisticated network of radio transmitters to make sure they could still communicate should the worst happen, but Five Council enlisted the services of 35 radio amateurs from Raynet who would spring into action should the council's radio system fall victim to the Millennium Bug. The idea being that the amateurs would use their radios to help emergency workers stay in touch with each other. Two repeater stations were in place to make sure their radio signals reached anywhere in the region. Now, in those days, the police and council up in Fife and other areas would have been using conventional radios. Airwave hadn't been rolled out yet, so I'm not sure what extra protection the radio amateurs could have provided. The Raynet group up there consisted of 35 radio amateurs who operated a 6.5 ton control vehicle which could provide communications wherever the council had the need and in which radios, telephones and a fax had all been installed. The council and police radio systems had backup power should, quote, the worst happen. Anyway, the vehicle was equipped with its own generator and two repeater stations were also in place to make sure the signals, allowing emergency workers to stay in touch with each other, could reach all parts of the region. The council's emergency planning officer Gordon Jacobs had been holding regular meetings with police, fire and ambulance representatives, as well as colleagues at Five Health Board and in the public utilities like electricity, gas and telephone providers in the few months prior to the millennium. He explained that if the council's own system went down, handsets would be distributed and employees would receive backup from Raynet. Gordon Jacobs was confident that the worst wouldn't happen, but his department wasn't burying their heads in the sand either. It turned out that the emergency planners were more concerned that telephone lines could be jammed for up to four hours after midnight on December the 31st, simply because more people than ever would want to wish each other a happy new year. There was an emergency planning officer on the Scottish Borders Council called Stan Yates, and he was more cautious about the communications problems facing his local authority. He said, phones won't work for approximately two hours after the millennium. 
and putting radios out so emergency staff can communicate after midnight. BT said they were confident its systems would cope with the volume of calls likely to be experienced at the millennium. While it was a nice bit of exposure for Raynet, the council went from planning for all-out chaos to being concerned about the high levels of congestion on the phone lines. Leonard Dunn, controller of Mid-Thames Raynet, was also making similar plans in the late summer of 1999. His group, consisting of 20 amateurs who met once a month, were already experienced in supporting the Wickham Half Marathon, Marlow Half Marathon, Scout events, rotor activities and a fire brigade challenge event to name a few. They had a mast and tripod along with other radio equipment and were poised to help in the event of a large scale communications outage caused by the Millennium Bug. He acknowledged the concern many people had over the approaching Millennium and volunteered to be called out if there was a major loss of communication. Leonard said he'd be staying in Beaconsfield for the big day and had an open mind to how events could unfold. He said, we'll be looking for guidance from the emergency planning officers and they are taking things very seriously. Along with many other Raynet groups, the Hampshire group was deployed on New Year's Eve as part of the Millennium Bug Concerns. Raynet stations were operational until after midnight at many of the council's emergency services control rooms, but the Millennium Bug never did appear. Action 2000 placed an eight-page pullout in British newspapers and spent a lot of money on ad campaigns. There was a lot of hype in the year running up to the 31st of January 1999, but just like at the police and council radio control rooms, the Millennium Bug failed to have any significant impact. In the US, the Naval Observatory reported its date as 19100 on its website, and over 150 slot machines at racetracks in Delaware failed. In Japan, a system collecting flight information for small planes failed. In Australia, some bus ticket validation machines failed. In Spain, someone was summoned to an industrial tribunal on the 3rd of February 1900, and in South Korea, a district court summoned 170 people to court on the 4th of January 1900. Telecom Italia sent out bills for the first two months of 1900, and here in the UK, some credit card transactions failed. And just like that, the much-anticipated civil disorder-causing, apocalypse-triggering millennium bug was resigned to the history books. I wonder how our emergency radio infrastructure will be affected by the upcoming year 2038 problem.